Um, so over the past few years, I've, I've had the privilege of giving a number of talks to the Thomistic Institute on university campuses. Uh, good universities or great ones like Toronto's are places where people come to make a grand future for themselves. Universities these days, and maybe in every all days, are for doers or achievers. But part of our Catholic faith is to think of the world of grand affairs, the world of doing and achieving, of impact and results and making a difference. All of that is something secondary. We can live our grand futures and make whatever impact we choose, but we have to remember all the while that we live as pilgrims in the world, that the world cannot be perfected, that it can barely be improved by our efforts, and that our highest hopes lie in God alone. So the most important route to remind ourselves of the reality of the purpose of our lives, as not in achieving, but in reaching towards God, is prayer and, of course, the sacraments. But tonight I want to talk about an additional route, not a substitute, but help, which is the root of study for its own sake. And I want to begin with how we imagine this type of study, um, how we imagine our lives or the lives of our, the work of our minds. We will also be thinking about study in the life of the mind, but I think our imagination shapes the way we live more than our thinking does. So suppose that, uh, I'm going to need to click in just a second. Suppose that in our imagination, we see a thinker like this, um, or a community of thinkers like this. Next one. Uh, these images are both from the corporate world, but our images of the arts or of uh, moral and political life are not much better. So uh, the next image is Diane Keaton playing a playwright in a 2001 film, Something's Gotta Give. And the next one is the New York Times editorial board. Um, if these images or similar images influence how we see thinking, how we imagine thinking, then we will see thinking and studying as a means to status and influence rather than something undertaken for its own sake. Now, there are intermediate images where the appeal to status is a bit less obvious and they're a little less banal. So consider the next painting. Uh, this is Raphael's extremely famous fresco of the School of Athens. It's grand. It features celebrity intellectuals. That's Plato and Aristotle in the center. And they're surrounded by other philosophers of Greece. They're gathered in a heavenly court that represents the airy realm of their imagined conversations. It's a royal community. The gathering of the great. It's not surprising that this image adorns the dorm rooms of a certain kind of student, those who seek to achieve in the realm of the intellect or to join the pantheon of the nerdy and the bookish. And there's nothing harmful about that. Um, but I want to talk about a, another image of the intellectual life, not as well known today, but much more common in the European art of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And that's the image of a teenage girl who loved reading. Now, the most common scene is the Annunciation. Uh, this is the, the scene in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, where the angel Gabriel greets Mary and tells her that she will become the mother of the Messiah. After a bit of struggle, she answers, Be it done unto me according to thy word. So why, um, in the paintings, and we'll see a number of them, why in the paintings of this extraordinary scene in Salvation History is Mary seen holding a book, or as we see sometimes surrounded by books, engrossed in study, as in the next two images. So just go one. See, she's got a huge stack in this particular image. And the next one, she's clearly embarked on a major study project um, that the angel is interrupting. Uh, this was actually a question I undertook for uh, as a procrastination project some years ago. <laughs> and so I learned quite a lot about the history of the image and its, its, its origins, and I'll go through that while also reflecting on why these images might matter for us. So Mary's book doesn't only appear in images of the Annunciation. It also appears in, uh, in images of Mary as the Queen of Heaven, uh, as in Van Eyck's Ghent altarpiece. So this altarpiece has been stolen 13 times. You can see why, it's ex exceptionally beautiful. Or in the next painting, 
where she reads in the Garden of Paradise, surrounded by other saints engaging in culminating activities of human life, playing music, that's the baby Jesus playing a psaltery, an instrument called a psaltery, um, playing music, uh, having conversations, uh, plucking fruit. Um, and the book, up, oh, there's another image that's familiar often to Canadians, uh, St. Anne, Mary's mother, teaching Mary to read. There's a statue showing that. And the book turns up in other contexts, as in Raphael's Madonna of the Goldfinch. Mary is babysitting John the Baptist. He's wearing camel's hair. And where an exchange with a goldfinch that represents crucifixion is central to the image, but you can see she's got her book with her. So it'll help to focus our thinking if we stick with the Annunciation uh, and focus on that, as that's where the book is most common, or the books, and it has the longest history and I think the richest spiritual meaning for us. So most of the paintings we'll be looking at are from the 14th to 16th century, and they're almost all European. Uh, and they go back quite a long time. Uh, I'm told by art history authorities that there are representations from the 9th century. I don't have any images of those. So I have some older ones. These are from the 13th, um, the stone representation on the outside of the cathedral at Chartres. Oh, oops, that's a Byzantine representation. Uh, <laughs> I knew that some people would be interested in this. Uh, it seems quite different because it's, uh, she's holding a book at the bottom, and I think the, that book is the Magnificat uh, displayed, so it's taking place after the Annunciation. Uh, and that may not be that old, it was just, it ended up out of order somehow. So the next one. Uh, oh, that's just her. Okay, next one. There's Chart. Okay, good. Um, so this is the stone representation outside the cathedral at Chart. You can see them on the left. And the book is between them as if it's describing what's going on. Um, so that's the 13th century, and uh, this is from a church in Rome, uh, also 13th century. You can see she has the book just tucked under her arm. And the oldest one of which I have the image is 11th century, which is the next one. It's this enamel, which has in it, it's worth looking at for a minute, it has in it all the elements that I'm interested in. It has the book. It has the proclamation of the angel represented in words. And it has, I wish I had a laser pointer, but you can see that there's a ray coming from the angel's finger um, up into Mary's ear. Uh, so that, those elements, although it's appearing early, find their way into almost all of the paintings that we're looking at. Uh, so sometimes the ray comes separately but simultaneously with the angel. Um, this is the Marode altarpiece. Uh, you can see the ray coming in through the window, and if you look carefully, there's a tiny infant Christ holding a cross who's coming in through the window on the ray. This is just a side point. This image is also interesting because she's, uh, there's uh, images of Jewish devotion, so she's holding the book in a Torah cloth. This would have been how you held the Torah, and in the background there's a Jewish prayer shawl. Uh, and then, um, sometimes it's a homunculus Christ. Uh, this, I think there is a ray of light coming from God the Father. The image is cut off a little bit, but uh, God the Father up there on the top left. If you look carefully, I think there's a little homunculus Christ coming down through the ray towards her ear. Uh, sometimes it's a dove, uh, as in this one. And in the later paintings, such as this one and the next, uh, the angel and sometimes even the dove have disappeared, and it looks like we're seeing a naturalized image. Okay, go back for a little bit. To, there, stay there. Okay. So the peaceful images that we've just seen of Mary conceiving as she reads lie in sharp contrast with images that show the Annunciation as an interruption. So this is the mild interruption of a teenage bookworm. If you look at her face, she looks very unhappy to be interrupted by the angel from her book. But in the next much more later paintings, we see really what looks like a violent interruption, um, a real drama that contrasts with the sort of peace and the naturalness of the earlier images. So this is Tintoretto, and the next one is Titian. Um, we can leave it there for a little bit. So here the angel is, is breaking in through the wall, and Mary looks extremely frightened. Uh, we can imagine that these images, the more violent images, 
focus on the moment in the gospel passage where Mary is greatly disturbed by the angel's message and asks how this can be. So the more violent images of the Annunciation raise the question, or they point to a question which we may have had already, which is why the scriptures themselves are silent as to the terror that would naturally accompany the content of the angel's message. In the scriptures, the disturbance seems to be just that an angel has appeared and hails her as full of grace. So if we imagine Mary as a living human being, we must have, she must have had plans, interests, concerns, her upcoming marriage to Joseph, her relations to her parents, her village, her religious elders. And it's never mentioned in the Gospels that in these circumstances to conceive a child out of marriage would expose a woman to death or to exile. So the invitation that's being offered to Mary has a dimension of a terrible fate. So, it, so there's a question about why this is not talked about and why instead we have relative calm, naturalness, and then the Magnificat, the praise given to God for this moment. It seems to me, and I, I'm going to mention this now and come back to it later and develop it, that the scriptures focus on her consent, uh, her willingness, and more than her consent, uh, the praise and the joy that come forth in the Magnificat. Mary is not, as we might have expected in Greek mythology, this is a commonplace, but it's true, she's not raped by God and give birth to a demigod. She's not forced, she's not captured. She chooses her motherhood freely, despite what must have been terrifying circumstances. Um, certain exile or death by stoning, or at minimum, as we do know from the scriptures, divorce, the loss of her loved one. So I also think that this reason, the emphasis on consent, is the reason why disturbance or violent disturbance such as this is a rare way to imagine the Annunciation in these paintings. Most paintings and the written tradition that we'll talk about that goes back to the Church Fathers reflect an image of Mary who is calm, reflective, wise, and even expectant of God's message to her. Her peaceful, contemplative character is in keeping with Luke's repeated remark that Mary kept all those things, reflecting on them in her heart. That's the first passage on your handout. Sometimes, if you switch forward, the angel does not even seem to touch her awareness. Um, she's not even looking at him. He's just present. Uh, or, in the, as in the next one, he remains outside the wall. Um, and her communion with the book, with the word of God, is what the Annunciation and the Conception seem to consist in. So let's look a little more closely at the, the ray or the dove going to her ear. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit, on the one hand, that enlightens her mind, or by which she conceives Christ. On the other, it is the words of an, the angel. Uh, you can see the words moving from his mouth to the ear. Um, the words of the scriptures that are being heard by her. So Paul, in the letter to the Romans, and now we're working through the handout if you want to look at it, follow along. Paul writes, faith comes through what is heard, and what is heard through the word of Christ. The words, then, that are going to her ear are not just ordinary words, and Mary's encounter with them is not an ordinary encounter, but the means by which she conceives the word of God, that is Christ. This is sometimes described in the tradition as conceptio per aurum, conception through the ear. And it is depicted sometimes very graphically, um, as in this hilarious tube from God the Father's mouth that goes down into uh, Mary's ear. This is from the cathedral in Würzburg in Germany. The notion of, of conception through the ear um, was famously and roundly mocked in the early 20th century by a student of Freud's named Ernest Jones, mocked for its apparent simplicity and uh, physicality. To me, I have to say the mockery doesn't make a lot of sense, um, since hearing and listening are key features of the Annunciation, and the way that we hear words always is through our bodily ears. How else would we hear or listen? Now, there's a mystery here, I think, even about ordinary words that's worth reflecting on. Um, how is it that an ordinary word 
which is a sound or a vibration in the air, can somehow enter our ears, our physical ears, and then touch us or change us or penetrate in some ways to the deepest parts of ourselves. That seems to be very mysterious um, and has something profound that I couldn't articulate to do with the reason that Christ is called the Word. St. Augustine writes beautifully on the meaning of Mary's conception through the ear. This is page uh, number three on your handout. The angel announces, the virgin hears, believes, conceives, faith in her mind, Christ in her womb. It's a common theme in Augustine's sermons. Uh, Mary conceives by faith, uh, not by lust or the flesh. He compares God's action on an ordinary believer. When you believe in the heart unto justice, you conceive Christ. When with the lips you confess unto salvation, you give birth to Christ. So at the Annunciation for the Fathers, and we'll see more of this, we see Mary's perfect receptivity and the fruit that receptivity bears, and it's held out to us as a kind of model, as something that we too are able to do, with the grace of God. Okay. Augustine writes more on the significance of hearing, and I won't read the whole passage, although it's there, but he appeals to uh, the passage from the Gospel, where Jesus says... Um, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Uh, So Mary too is blessed because she heard the word of God and kept it. He means, I think, Augustine to hold out an amazing prospect to an ordinary believer. We cannot conceive Christ in our wombs, literally, but we can conceive him in our hearts and in our minds, and we can bear fruit, uh, even if it's spiritual fruit. So Ephraim the Syrian writes, Mary, the thirsty land in Nazareth, conceived our Lord by her ear. Ephraim is drawing a comparison with a Samaritan woman at the well. You too, a woman thirsting for water, conceived the son by your hearing. Mary planted him in the manger, but you planted him in the ears of his hearers. Ephraim too shows Mary at this moment to be a model for believers We who, like her, receive the word through our ears. Sometimes um, the fathers contrast Mary's ear, receptive to the word of God, with Eve's, receptive to the deceiving words of the devil. Mary as the new Eve is a theme in some Annunciation scenes in the background here with this painting. This is Fra Angelico's Annunciation. You see Adam and Eve driven out of the Garden of Eden. Mary's intellectual virtues, her understanding, and her wisdom undo Eve's intellectual vices, her susceptibility to deception, and her doubt of the word of God. So Ephraim says, again, we're on seven, just as from the small womb of Eve's ear, death entered in and was poured out, so through a new ear that was Mary, that was Mary's, life entered and was poured out. And I also put Tertullian on there, although I won't go through it. Mary's hearing of the word and her conceiving in faith is a key part of the piece of the scriptures and the piece of the paintings, their naturalness, their nonviolence. That's because, as I've suggested, consent is central. And consent becomes richer and more natural uh, as understanding becomes greater. Consider a more ordinary type of consent, the consent to say to marry someone. However mysterious that might be, however inevitably connected to what's unknown, it's richer when we know the person deeply and when we understand what kind of happiness life is offering to us. If we've just met the person, or we are ignorant or naive, or if our minds have been shaped by false images of happiness, then our consent is going to mean less. It's going to be less full and less rich. So part of what I think is in the background of the father's thinking and the painting's thinking is that the understanding uh, makes consent something richer and realer and fuller. So to see this at work uh, in our images, or to, it, it's in the text at this point, let's go back to the beginning, the earliest sources I know of, of this idea that Mary loved to read. Church Father Origen, 
And we are now, okay, six, uh, number nine, okay. The church father Origen in the third century comments on the first chapter of Luke. He explains that Mary is only surprised at the words of the angels. She's only startled because she had read the Bible carefully enough to know that the greeting had never appeared elsewhere. It's unprecedented in scripture to be addressed this way. He writes, she knew the law, she was holy, and she had learned the writings of the prophets and meditating on them daily. St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan and mentor of Augustine, in his own commentary on Luke, suggests, as Origen does, that Mary had studied the prophets and so knew all of the messianic prophecies. She knows already, in other words, that, the, that a virgin will give birth to the king of kings. She has only to learn that she is that virgin. So here is Ambrose. Uh, it was Mary's part neither to refuse belief in the angel, nor to hastily take unto herself the divine message. And then there's a contrast with Zechariah, which happens earlier in the chapter. She avows herself willing to do that which she doubts not will be done, but how she is anxious to know. Mary had read, behold, she shall conceive and bear a son. She believed, therefore, that it should be, but how it was to take place she had never read. The painters express this way of thinking about Mary by showing that the book she is reading is Isaiah 7. So this is Tomasio di Massimino, and if you look at a close-up of the book, you can see it says, Ecce virgo concipit, behold, a virgin shall conceive. And the same is true in the next image by Matthias Grunewald. You can see in the big scene, if you look close in at the book, um, as in the next image, you can see that it says, behold, a virgin shall conceive. So they have the verse from Isaiah on the open uh, on the book in the painting. In this way of imagining Mary, she knows, she knows Jesus in some way before he arrives. She's learned from reading and study and prayer to know the promises of God and to recognize them as they unfold in fulfillment. She knows about the coming of God's salvation in the form of the Messiah and that he will be born of a virgin. And we see some beautiful instances of this foreknowledge again in the Syriac fathers. So Ephraim the Syrian writes in Mary, this must be on the other side right now. Uh, yes, 11. Ephraim the Syrian writes in Mary's voice, Isaiah gave your good news of Emmanuel. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and give birth. Am I having a dream or a vision? Behold, on my lap is Emmanuel. So the images of her holding her child on her lap and recognizing that this child is the child that she's read about, is the Messiah. So there's a wonderful dialogue in the next passage uh, uh, from the Syriac tradition between Mary and Joseph that describes an argument on who knows the Bible better. So Joseph says, you've gone astray like water, chaste girl. Take the scriptures and read how virgins do not conceive without intercourse, as you are saying. Mary says, you have gone astray, Joseph. Take and read for yourself. In Isaiah, it is written all about me. How a virgin shall bear fruit. If that's not true, do not accept my word. So the idea of her reading Isaiah as the angel arrives is not universal in the paintings. As we've seen, sometimes the book is small, so it's probably a Psalter or a book of, all, a book of hours. She's praying the Psalms. Or sometimes it seems she's in the midst of a whole course of study. Uh, perhaps scripture study. Uh, the crucial fact, I think, for the fathers of the church and for the painters is the virtues of Mary. In order to be the mother of God, she must be uh, excellent in certain ways, courageous, which I think is evident in the gospel on any reading, but also wise and learned, hungry to know the things of God. So in the next passages are a couple from the seventh century um, the first is an apocryphal biography. Uh, and the scene in both of these next passages is the temple where tradition tells us she dedicated herself to as a young girl. This is her education in the temple. So the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, uh, I'm just going to read from the middle. No one is more learned in the wisdom of the law and God. Uh, she was always engaged in prayer and in searching the law. Also, the 7th century father, Maximus the Confessor. Uh, 
had. She loved learning and was an excellent student. She was an expert in every good stu- subject and filled with understanding of the divine scriptures and with all wisdom, as she was to become the mother of the word and wisdom of God. She was clever with words and had a pleasant voice. Uh, she was intelligent with respect to images and words. Just reading down a bit. Uh, so why, again, do... I'm going to try to draw my threads together. Why do Mary's wisdom and intelligence matter? Um, why did the fathers seek to view her as learned or well-read, as anticipating in her heart and mind already the shapes of God's will for her? So we come back to the question of her consent, her capacity to agree to what is in simple terms a terrible fate. Where does Mary get the strength to consent in this way? We can appeal easily to the supernatural character of her faith, to supernatural graces, to miraculous interventions of various kinds. Uh, These graces and miracles are real, but one pitfall of faith can be a kind of magical thinking, like alien superpowers in the movies, God's intervention can solve any problem. But to appeal, I think, to her consent as being purely miraculous would be to miss the point that the fathers and the artists following them assume that Mary is a human being who who is a model for us, the model for us after Christ, and a model offered to us in mercy so that a mere human being, and not just the God-man, can mark, mark out a path for us so that we can walk in her footsteps. If she exists purely in the realm of the miraculous, she cannot be a model for us. We cannot command grace, but we can prepare for its coming by modeling our lives on Mary's in certain ways. So what is the human basis or the natural basis for Mary's consent? This is the last part of my talk about why I think that this involves a human or a natural basis. Ambrose is perhaps the first voice in the tradition who suggests that Mary was not just a reader, but was reading at the Annunciation. Uh, So this is, we are now at the last text, 15. Uh, As he describes the scene, she, when the angel entered, was found at home in privacy without a companion, that no one might interrupt her attention or disturb her. And she did not desire any women as companions, who had the companionship of good thoughts. Moreover, she seemed to herself to be less alone when she was alone. For how could she be alone who had with her so many books, so many archangels, so many prophets? The paintings show, and I think if you think back through all of them, they always show what St. Ambrose describes, Mary's solitude. She's always by herself. She's sheltered and enclosed in her study. Uh, There's one more image that that I'll talk about, about this last. And she's enclosed in her study at echo, in a way that echoes the garden enclosed in the Song of Songs. Uh, the soul of, believer that, of the believer that's hidden in silence and quiet and suffering and darkness and that awaits the personal visitation of God. So her bookish solitude is a sign of her independence, her lack of ambition, her focused absorption, her recollection. It's emphasized at the moment of the angel's appearance because the angel's proposal is such a grave challenge, as I've suggested, comparable only to God's invitation to Abraham to slaughter his son. Her inward focus, her love for words, and the teaching of the scriptures enables her to consent regardless of the social consequences of the angel's proposal. Only a profound trust in a goodness beyond any offered by social life could permit such a decision, a trust nurtured in inward seclusion, retirement, prayer, study, and endurance. These features of Mary's life are described for us and imagined for us in a way that models it so that we we too can conceive Christ in faith and give birth to him in word and action. And I think it's worth mentioning that the inward focus shown by Mary's studiousness is also part of the meaning of her perpetual virginity. She doesn't submit to the common purpose that the community establishes for women, that is, the extension of clans and bloodlines or sexual pleasure. So her virginity also secures her dignity, 
her standing beyond mere social utility. The social world imagined this way, and I think it's uh, where we start out with the social world, even if it's not where we end up. It's a realm of ambition and competition. It's an engine, a place of using and instrumentalizing. Uh, it's where energy dissipates into anxiety and conflict. And only in withdrawing from it can the fundamentals of human and divine life become clear. So this is why in these paintings of the angel's announcement from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, Mary is always alone and sometimes explicitly removed from the hustle and bustle of city streets. This is why this is an interesting painting. And her shelter or enclosure, her hidden room, is always emphasized. The development of her mind and her heart takes place in private, in the garden enclosed, and it represents an intimate meeting between the word of God and herself where the word is understood both as a divine invitation, immediately understood, and as Christ himself, whom she carries in her womb. It's interesting to contrast images of another much-painted Catholic intellectual, uh, St. Jerome. Oh, he's too forward, sorry. St. Jerome is sometimes painted in a study, but he's usually in the desert. His withdrawal is total. He flees human society. By contrast, the images of Mary are always of her withdrawn in domestic life or in city life, uh, in the case of the painting we just saw, as being alone while also being surrounded by others. And that strikes me as being something profound. I couldn't put my words on it. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out. So Mary presents the intellectual life as a withdrawal from the world to cultivate an inward life. The fathers might have thought of her, they might have, uh, as a bodily vehicle for the divine body of Christ. But they didn't. They thought of her inner life was crucial, her consent above all to the divine plan, her fiat, uh, be it done unto me according to thy word. And the fathers remind us of her possession of the intellectual virtues, thoughtfulness, wisdom, and understanding that make that consent possible. In the face of everyday pressures and demands to the contrary, she chooses the most important things. So her image is drawn in these sources to reflect the highest development of a human being, humanity in its full dignity and splendor, an actor at a crucial moment in the history of the world, in the history of salvation, but also a model for anyone to imitate. So I claim that Mary's solitude, inwardness, seclusion, and love of study is the human basis for her receptivity to grace, her extraordinary receptivity to grace. And I'd like to conclude by illustrating a bit uh, the universality and the humanity of this basis by looking at how its features are reflected elsewhere in some surprising parallels with, with these images that we find in non-Catholic or even non-religious contexts. So uh, consider the story of Albert Einstein, uh, and I know there are grad students here, so I have to tell you that he was judged a failure as a graduate student in physics. He could not find work teaching or researching at a university. So all grad students should remember this. Um, he worked for seven years as a patent clerk. And this picture is of him in this patent office. In his spare time, he wrote seminal papers on uh, the photoelectric effect, Brownian movement, and the theory of special relativity. Uh, incredible groundbreaking papers. He called in a letter his patent office that worldly cloister where I hatched my most beautiful ideas. Mm. By calling the patent office a worldly cloister, Einstein means that this place of legal business where a normal employee might go to learn a living in exchange for performing a certain public service was for him a place of removal and retreat. For someone else, it might have been a launching pad for a career in the civil service, but it's a cloister for him because there are no professors to impress, no administrators to placate, no students to whom to justify his existence. It's a place where his own love of learning is put to the test and where his ambition is frustrated and where it has to run on his own power without incentives or disincentives that come from competition or social life. So in the quiet, at least as I imagine it, the quiet of the patent office, the beauty of the structures of nature can take hold of him and 
display themselves to him with clarity. So here's another image. Uh, this is from a film. These are going to be all over the place. That's just the latest. This is from a French art house film uh, from the late, uh, I guess, 2009, uh, called The Hedgehog. Um, this woman who's depicted here is uh, the concierge of an apartment building in Paris, very, very wealthy apartment building. And she plays out in public a sort of cranky, ignorant stereotype of a working class person. And then she has behind her door a secret hidden room full of books where she goes and retreats and reads and reflects and cultivates herself. And it's thanks to that inward li inner life that she cultivates in this hidden room that she forges friendships with other people in the building who are alienated from the achievement-oriented nature of the building. Uh, then there are some more familiar traditional figures. A uh, figure of Socrates. Oh, good, there he is. I couldn't find a good one of him looking withdrawn, but uh, if in Plato's dialogue, the symposium, there's a beautiful passage where he's gotten all dressed up for a dinner party. Socrates is depicted as an extremely social being, always talking to people, always surrounded by people. So he's dressed up to go to this dinner party, and he's walking with his friends, and he stops on the threshold and just freezes, lost in thought, for several minutes while his friends go on ahead. He's completely oblivious to what's around him. So that's an example of a withdrawn character uh, in the midst of a, a social realm. Uh, or lastly, this is probably my favorite. Uh, this is Archimedes, uh, the ancient mathematician and scientist. Uh, he apparently, in the legend told about his life, um, was so wrapped up in studying that he didn't notice that the Romans were invading his native town of Syracuse. Um, he had helped prepare for the invasion. He knew it was coming, so his engineering talents helped, helped defend it. But once, once he had done his engineering, he went off to do his mathematics. Um, and when a soldier arrived to arrest him and take him to the Roman authorities, he insisted on finishing his proof, um, and the soldier killed him. So uh, later, writers gave him last words. Um, don't disturb my circles. So that's, don't disturb my circles. Uh, so with that, I'd like to bring it to a close. My basic thought is something like this, that withdrawal, solitude, leisure, focus, um, and giving free reign to the desire to understand, these are all human or natural means, which can be found in a variety of contexts and properly understood, they are, can be means to a supernatural destiny. They could be natural goods on which grace operates. Uh, and I think that's part of what the images of Mary and her intellectual life mean. So thank you very much. Yes. Oh, you mentioned grace. Yeah. Well, she's addressed as full of grace eh, when the angel comes. Um, so I think that that's often interpreted as being someone who has a remarkable capacity to receive grace. Um, there may be other passages, but that's the most famous. Uh, yeah, sure no, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, but I, was, uh, I wasn't drawing directly on sources, but looking at the whole tradition. Yeah, yeah thinking in a general way about it. Do you have a concern that was behind that question? Or? Uh, well, I was just thinking of my grandmother. So, just Grace and uh, you mentioned someone who her educated. She was highly educated and that helped her with her grace in some way or something. I, th I think my thought was just that it's, it's not so much highly educated. If I were to say, if I were to put it like that, I tried to be very careful. So if I said, being highly educated makes you especially susceptible to grace. You didn't use the word yeah. yeah. No, it wouldn't be true. And it would be and there would be obvious counterexamples that everyone would, would flood everyone's mind. But the idea is that an intellectual life understood this way, that is one that's withdrawn um, for its own sake, undertaken for personal growth, and that's withdrawn from the world of competition, ambition, and yeah. the world. Um, uh, that kind of uh, use of the mind makes one receptive to grace. Yeah, that's 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. I think you the talk. It's, uh, it's a great reflection of folks here and uh, especially from the fathers. Uh, and a good topic. I've often thought about um, in this connection the uh, right, the visitation. I mean, the, the first thing that Mary does after in the gospel there, right. right after uh, right. the visitation, is, is makes haste and goes to uh, visit Elizabeth. And, uh, you know, it. it Potentially, um, you know, yes. also to visit Zachariah and discuss what's happened and the people who are involved. Right. I didn't mean to be uh, in any way exhausting the meaning of her virginity. I think it's pretty rich and has a, a lot of history and theology, which is something I have only a partial grasp on. The only thing that I, I, I do think that part of it is that she, um, in an obvious way, her dignity doesn't lie in her social use. Because marriage, apart from anything else, is useful. <laughs> you. Um, bring children into the world, which are often also useful. Um, it, you, um, you, ex yeah, you extend clans, you can unite forms of property, um, you connect bloodlines. So marriage has a lot of dimensions of social use. We don't think about that nowadays because we have a very romantic view of it, but I think that is the way that it is commonly in history. So my thought is that and part of it, I think, is actually less in a way in Mary than in the sort of like the Roman martyrs um, where uh, these women just refuse uh, to be the property of their fathers or their husbands um, and just insist that their dignity lies with God and not with uh, the kind of uh, social role that's being offered by their surroundings. It's just an aspect of it. Um, it's not meant to exhaust it. Does that help? trying to remember the, the name of the painter. It's the Marode altarpiece, and it's in um, the cloisters in New York. And oh, it's it's Campen. Maybe it's Campen. Sorry. It's interesting because I have a friend who's Jewish and a historian, and she's often citing um, anti-Semitic images from medieval art. And so wow. I would like to share. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, there is one counterexample. I, 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 I think it is surprising to see that, this, this honoring of Mary's Jewish heritage. Um, I, I don't know how typical it is. That's the sort of thing I would ask a historian, but, um, but it is, it's moving, I think. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm interested in what kind of role you see uh, Mary's humility playing in her intellectual life, because usually, I think that's exactly right, and I, it's actually, in a certain way, a better way of saying what I was trying to say, or another way of saying it anyway. Um, I think I was trying to get
get to that at the beginning when, I, when I'm trying to mark out her, and also at the end, her intellectual way of being, her life of the mind as being something which is not competitive, right? It's something she's doing for herself and for God, right? It's not about impressing people, it's not, and, and one of the reasons I think why I was initially attracted to the image is that I was trying to, and this is part of what my book which is coming out is about, which is actually now called Lost in Thought and Not Intellectual Life, but it's coming out soon. Uh, but I wanted to try to find a way to articulate when and why intellectual life can be something humbling uh, rather than something which seems much more common in life as something that, that makes people, is a, is a, a form of competition. Um, an extremely aggressive form of competition. Of exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, I've been trying to explore for some time, um, trying to understand what the, the human good of uh, the life of the mind is, on which grace can operate, and just try to distinguish it from uh, what I would call a corrupted, corrupted forms, which are much more common forms which get mixed with competition, ambition, and so on. Um, and it gets quite complicated in real life because of course you may be um, uh, an academic or an intellectual or professional of some kind and it becomes very difficult in that life to, to navigate, you know, am I doing this for my own sake? Am I doing it for someone else? Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the background of the kind of question. I mean, but yeah, I think one of the reasons why I think Mary is a beautiful example is because the humility is so clear it's so evident uh, that this is, this is not a competitive enterprise that she's embarked in. Yeah. So do you think it's fair to me to say that one of the things that sets Mary's intellectual life apart, and like, especially in like the fathers in the Middle Ages, is the um, sort of metaphysical category of passivity in which it's placed to. She's receptive to grace, she's receptive to this knowledge. She's not seeking it for her own accord. It's something that she's open to the movements of the spirit, and from that comes wisdom. I think that's right, although, and I, I, I tried to say that by talking about uh, receptivity, which we were also talking about at Madonna House the other night, so I wanted to bring that in. The, the thing about it that I think is maybe a little bit misleading is that, in a way, it's perfect receptivity, it's perfect humility. In another way, I think it must be something very alive and active, right? So she must really love those books, right? The script. In, in this realm of devotion that we're imagining, she is in love with the scriptures. She wants to absorb them. There's a desire to, to understand, I think. So it's, it's not, it's, if, you, if, I, if you emphasize passivity or receptivity too much, it sounds like the books come off the shelves and you know, open themselves up and oh, she's just got to. Whereas I, I think there has to be something in her or in us that pulls us towards these things. Um, I think that, so I don't know quite how to make that all work out. Yes. That's a great question. Um, I've spent some time looking and I've heard reports. There's a report of one, I think, that's in a window in a church in England, <laughs> but I don't know which one, I don't know where, and I would have to do some work to hunt it down, where in her, in her library that's depicted in the scene, you have Aristotle's physics, so you have her <laughs> studying nature. <laughs> so then, that, then you imagine her having a very broad uh, intellectual interest in She's seeing. Well, well that, that's, we all knew that, I didn't have to say that out loud. Uh, but, uh, but so, um, I know about that example. I, I, I wish I had uh, more examples of that. It's almost always the scriptures. Um, but it's also, I think the scriptures were thought of as being the source of all kinds of knowledge and not just, that, that argument between Joseph and Mary, I think suggests that the idea is somehow the scriptures tell you everything. It's, it's not um, the way we think of it now as being a, a sort of a genre of a book among many others, one that contains a variety of, of types of knowledge. I find it hard to work my way into that way of thinking, but I think it's there. Anyway, if I, if I ever find the aerosols physics image, I'll, I think it's often a, salt, a book of psalms. Um, so I think when the book is small, 
I think you're meant to think it's a book of Psalms. And there's also some written, some literary sources for that. I didn't bother including, but they're, 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 that's also there. Pr she's praying the Psalms. Uh, yes? Uh, what do you think that illustration and, uh, and just like our knowledge and the paintings of Mary and Mary's intellectual life come from? Because it seems hard to me to find sort of biblical evidence. So is this one? Yeah. Did, did the father sort of infer from what we know of Mary being poor for race, being this beautiful, um, pious woman who accepted the will of the Lord? Or is there more direct like, traditions or biblical references that, that would point us to this sort of... Yeah. What, what you you know, well, so I, I have to say, I actually like it the way it is. So, so no, there's not scriptural evidence apart from... Her meditativeness, you know, she takes things and meditates on them in her heart and the sort of peace, with, relative peace with which she receives the angel's message as opposed to Zechariah. Um, so there's not, but I think I wouldn't really want it that way. And I, I, I think that the fathers, I mean, I tried to say something about this. I think that the fathers are really trying to uh, emphasize her understanding, her virtues, her fittingness for receiving God and her capacity to understand what was happening to her. So her, her deep receptiveness, not just whatever God tells me, but you know, I know that God is the God of the scriptures. I know that God keeps his promises as he did to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I know that if he promises me this, he's going to come through with it. So the, it, it, it signals a kind of depth of faith. But I actually don't want it to be too, because I think it is a strand of devotion, right? It's, it shouldn't be required to be devoted to Mary, to think of her as being a high-powered intellectual, right? Uh, you, sh you, you might find more, uh, a more meaningful approach to think of her as being a, a simple Jewish housewife. Uh, that might be a much more uh, fruitful route. Um, and I think there's, that's also something which is rooted in the tradition and has a kind of foundation. She's often, in the Byzantine images, um, she's usually pictured with a spindle, if you look at the icons. She has a, she's spinning, so she's doing domestic work uh, and not reading. So I think it's good to have more than one route. Um, and I, I, I'd rather it weren't sort of set that, you know, it is biblically established that she was a person with a huge intellectual life. Uh, but I find it beautiful and interesting, and it has helped me to think about these things. There are certain things which are fixed by the faith about Mary that we know because of the tradition teaches them. And there's quite a lot of room in my way of thinking to, um, it, for the purposes of devotion or thinking or imagination, to, to imagine different ways that things might have been. Uh, was Joseph old? Was he young? Um, did she read because she was raised in the temple or did she read because she liked reading? Um, was it something that all the Jewish children did or was it something that her parents especially taught were interested in passing on to her. I think that um, it's, it's a beautiful fact, feature of our tradition that um, ways of imagining are left open and that, so that the East imagines it differently than the West sometimes. Sometimes they come together. Um, so uh, I guess, yeah, I, would, I, I think trying to be too strict about how exactly things happened can, can close off ways of devotion to, to people. So, but, but thank you for sharing your Yes. On that exact topic, uh, I know a number of saints have had visions mm. uh, of the life of Mary and the life of Christ before he began his ministry. Mm. Uh, and I guess it's sort of in the realm apparition, sort of revelation. Uh, in your own studies, have you come across any of these saints, or have you made any stuff for church fathers? Um, I had not uh, actually, no, I, mean, I know some about some of the Marian apparitions. I had not known that there were apparitions about her childhood. Actually, I'd be very interested to hear about them, uh, or about her youth or, or her life as a young person. Yes, in our life, I think I've had visions given to them about her life. Ah, interesting, yeah. interesting. No, I'd be very interested to hear about them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for coming tonight. Please join us again.